3D screen effects. They add an extra level of production value to your videos, and that's why so many people are using them nowadays. But contrary to what you might think, it's not done using a real camera and a real screen. I tried it did not work that well. Instead, it's done using programs like DaVinci Resolve Fusion. And today we're gonna talk about how you can do it for yourself in the free version of DaVinci Resolve. I have three different methods to create this effect, but two of them stand out. The other option I don't really recommend using, unless you just need something really quick and dirty. It's using the DVE node, and while it allows you to manipulate a 2D image with 3D controls, it can be really annoying, and it's easy to accidentally hide half the screen since it's going past the camera. This option also doesn't allow you to do fancier stuff like depth of field, which is one of the most important components of this effect. The two methods that we're going to be covering in this video is the 3D system inside of Fusion, and then the second one is a new tool in my editor collection pack. I'll talk more about that preset at the end of the video, but right now I just want to show you a real quick quality comparison as well as time comparison. Keep in mind the benchmarks I have aren't really scientific, and they're generalized since the actual time is going to be dependent on the hardware inside of your computer. But it's going to take about half the time to set up with 3D camera as compared to the system that we're going to talk about today. And none of these benchmarks are going to include the additional stuff like chromatic aberration, scan lines, and so on. To render a 4K 5 second clip using DaVinci's system, it took my computer anywhere from 10 to 50 minutes depending on the quality of depth of field that I used. Using the same clip with Whip 3 3D camera, it took only 53 seconds to render, meaning it's anywhere from 10 to 50 times faster. And if you look at the end result, you can make a good argument that my tool looks way better, and there's no denying that it's easier to control since it can be used right on the edit page. Remember, these are just rough estimates, but I can guarantee you that you'll have significantly faster performance using my tool. Like I said, at the end of the video, I'm going to showcase how easy it is to use, but for now, let's talk about building it from scratch. Inside of DaVinci Resolve, on the edit page, I just have this 5 second clip that we're going to be working with. You can see I take my mouse and I subscribe to my YouTube channel, which you should do by the way. And we just want to have a 3D camera following the mouse throughout this whole interaction. So the first thing I want to do is make this clip into a fusion clip. So to do that, just right click and then do new fusion clip. And now we want to set up our 3D scene. The easiest way to do that is click on your media and node, then click on the image plane, the merge 3D, the camera 3D, and the render 3D node. If we rearrange these around, you'll notice that it doesn't actually connect them up, but we can just take the output of the render node and plug that into the media out, and now everything is going through the 3D system. I usually like to have this set up with my media out in the right viewer, which it is by default. And then I take the merge 3D node and drag that to my first viewer. This allows me to see what I'm working on in the left, and then the result on the right. Inside the 3D viewer, I'd recommend having a 3-button mouse, as it's so much easier to navigate around. If you hold down control and scroll in and out, it's going to allow you to zoom. If you middle click and move around, it allows you to pan back and forth. And if you do the same thing but hold down alt as well, it allows you to rotate around a center point. So using those controls, we can navigate all around the viewer interface. To change what's actually being outputted, we want to grab the camera 3D node here, and we can just use any one of these controls and either move it back, move it to the side, move it up, and just move it all around. Let's pull this way back so that way we can see most of our 3D screen. Inside the inspector, we can go to the transform tab of the camera, and this allows us to see all of those points in just the normal control. Let's set the X and Y back to zero, and now we can just use the Z to pull it out so it fits the frame. This is how you'd set it up if you wanted to start at a full screen view and then zoomed in after that. But since we want to look at the subscribe button, let's grab the Z point and move it closer to the screen. Then we can use the X and the Y to move it down so it's centered on subscribe. But right now this is still very flat. We could do all this just using the normal transform node. That's where these rotation controls come in. If I move this, it allows us to change the direction that the camera is actually looking. So I can move this to the side, maybe have it look up, and then I can adjust all of these position controls uh, so that way we get the 3D look. You'll notice right away that these can be kind of finicky and a little bit difficult to play with. That's why I usually don't use the system to control it. Double click on all of the rotation controls to set them back to the default. Then hit this use target button down here. You'll notice that the camera is going to snap and start looking in a different direction. Inside the merge 3D node, we can see this new control that's appeared. And if we drag this back and forth, the camera is always going to be facing the center point. And then no matter what the placement of the camera is, it's always going to face that one center point. So let's say we start our shot off with an angle like this. If we come all the way to the beginning, we want to add a keyframe on the center X, Y, and Z, and then as well as the X, Y, and Z for the target. Moving all the way to the end of the clip, we can rotate our camera around, and we'll just move these controls back and forth until we get it in the resting position. A lot of times I like to move the target a little bit too, just so it has a little bit extra motion. Going back to the beginning, we can hit play, and now you'll see it's going to have a really cool 3D panning motion moving from left to right. You'll notice that the quality isn't great throughout this, because uh, I'm just working in 1920 by 1080 Whenever I do a video, even if it's in a 1080 project, I always render it in 4K, because that way I have the freedom to crop in and zoom in on the screen even more. So, whenever possible, use 4K. 
All right, so that is looking really good. One other control that you can always animate inside of the camera is the focal length. If we come back to the controls tab, we have the angle of view and the focal length. These are both the same control, just represented in a different way. I usually like leaving it close to the default, but you can move this to get either a tighter or wider angle of view. You can also animate it, so maybe it starts with a wide angle at the beginning and then is really tight at the end. Once you get that figured out though, the next thing that we want to do is add in some depth of field. So there's two different ways to use depth of field inside of Fusion. There's the first method that takes a really long time, but that's the one that gives you a better result. And then there's the second method, which is substantially faster, but the result isn't as good. Let's talk about the fast way real quick. The reason it doesn't work as good is because it's not working in the actual 3D system. After the render 3D node, if you do shift space and type depth blur, we can add in that node. By default, this is not going to do anything, and that's because it is trying to blur based on the Z channel. A normal image has four different channels. It has the red, the green, the blue, and the alpha. But this node needs a fifth channel, and that's the Z channel. Inside the render node, we can come down to output channels, and we want to check Z. If we hover on the screen, you can see down in the bottom right, there is a Z value. And as we move this back and forth, it's going to tell us the distance that that pixel is from the camera. So using this image, the depth blur can add a fake depth of field to the image. To get this to work, we need to bring the Z scale way down. Usually I like putting this at something like 0.7. Then I bring the blur size way up. Once you start to see the depth of field, you can just grab the sample button and just clicking and dragging, you can take this little pick whip tool and you can select anywhere on the image. And as you can see, as I move this back and forth, it's doing a focus pull. So whatever I am hovering over, that's the part that's gonna be in focus. Let's put that right on the subscribe button and then maybe bring the Z scale down to something like 0.4, just so it's a little bit more intense. Can also bring the blur size up maybe 25 and there we go we have a depth of field effect and you'll notice right away that it doesn't always look that good there's a lot of haloing that goes on especially with detailed objects if we come up to the filter we can change this to soften and that looks a little bit better sometimes uh, but still it's not the best looking result if you do still want to use it you can just add a keyframe on this focal point come to the end and then you'll want to grab the sample button again just to make sure it is still in focus. And then maybe go somewhere in the middle, add another keyframe right there. That way it just remains in focus the entire time. So yes, this method is really fast, but it really does not look that good. Back in the render 3D node, I'm going to turn off the Z position just because we don't need it anymore. And I'm going to switch this render type to hardware render. This means that it's just going to use our GPU instead of our CPU to render. You can see a new control has appeared, the accumulation effects. If we turn that on, your system's going to load for just a second as it starts rendering this depth of field. And right away, we're going to get a crazy result. While we're adjusting it and getting focus, I'm going to bring this quality way down. Let's put it somewhere around 6. Again, a really crazy result. But if we come into the camera node, we can come down to control visibility and then check focal plane. That's going to create this green rectangle inside the merge node. And that's just going to show what area is in focus. So you can see that's really far away from our screen. And that's why we can see so many of these callout texts. If we just grab this focal plane slider, we can drag this forward. And you can see how slow this is and how laggy it is. As I move this control back and forth, it takes a little while for the slider to update. Something to make that work a little bit better, if you right click on the toolbar, you can do auto proxy. What this will do is lower the resolution of the view while we're making a change. So that allows us to work way faster. Another thing that I've noticed is this focal plane control doesn't allow you to go below the 0.5. Even if you type in a different value like 0.2, as soon as you update this, it's just going to snap back to 0.5. So if that ever happens, we're going to come into the render 3D node and turn off those accumulation effects. We're going to drag this camera point way back and then up the angle of view. So that way we get the same thing, but the camera is farther away from the screen. Let's come back to the first point and do the same thing. We just want to drag this back till we get the same view. All right, but once we got that fixed, let's come back to the render 3D node, enable those depth effects. And now inside the camera, we can just drag this focal plane forward until the subscribe button comes in focus. Right now, this effect is really strong, and we'll talk about customizing that. But add a keyframe on the focal plane, then come to the last frame, and make sure that subscribe button is still in focus. You'll also want to go in the middle, make sure it is still in focus here. So let's just drag this back until subscribe comes in focus. And then maybe just go in between all those keyframes. Um, and just make sure it remains in focus the entire time. You might have to add a couple of keyframes depending on how long the clip actually is. All right, but once you've added in enough keyframes so that way it is in focus the entire time, back in the render 3D node, we can bring down the amount of depth of field. So we wanna bring this pretty low, and then once we find the amount that we want, that's when we'll wanna bring the quality slider back up. And as we bring the quality slider up, you can see the depth of field is gonna get way smoother. 
but your computer is also going to take way longer to load. Like those benchmarks at the beginning, in a 4K clip with the quality at 30, it took about 10 minutes to render for the 5 second clip. And when the quality was at 200, which is a little bit less than this, it actually took 49 minutes for it to render that 5 second clip. So ideally, you want to find something that is as low as possible. And now, we're going to talk about two different ways that we can make this even better, and that's going to be chromatic aberration and scan lines. While we set these up, I'm going to turn off the depth of field just so that way it doesn't take forever to load every time we make a change. After the media end node, do shift space and type in chromatic aberration. Once we add that on, we can just mess around with these controls until it adds a bit of a chromatic aberration effect. When you're adjusting this, you can see that auto proxy turn on, and it gets to the point that we can't even tell what's happening. So right click on the toolbar and turn off that auto proxy. That way it's easier to make precise movements and we can see exactly what's going on. Once you find something that you like with that, just move this node off to the side and after the media in, add in the scan lines tool. This is one that does need some tweaking right from the start because this looks pretty bad. And whenever I'm working with it, I usually just bring this line frequency all the way up to 20. And then I bring the line sharpness down close to zero, just so that way it's not quite as intense. Um, bring this up a little bit until we can start to see it. Something like that. Then, since a normal screen doesn't just have lines going across, it has like individual pixels, I always copy this node, paste it after, and then bring this line angle to negative 90. So that way these ones are going up and down instead of side to side. That'll create a really nice pixel effect, especially in unison with that chromatic aberration. If we go back to the render 3D, we can enable these depth effects. And just by adding in those two nodes, we have a lot better looking 3D screen effect. However, it does take a little while to render. In the middle of the clip here, I still think those scan lines are a little too intense, so I'm just going to come back into those nodes and bring the sharpness down just a little bit more, and then just make sure it matches between both of those nodes. Once that's done, go back to the edit page, right-click on the clip, and do Render in Place. I usually set the format to be MP4, and then when I hit Render, it's going to render that into an MP4, so that way it plays back in real time throughout the rest of your editing. But instead of waiting 30 minutes for that to render, I'm going to show you how easy and simple it is to create that using Whip 3D Camera from the Editor Collection. But now that we have that set back to the normal, I'm going to go up to my effects library, come down to effects, and grab Whip 3D Camera. Once I put that on the clip, there's going to be no change on the first frame, and then it's just going to slowly zoom into the center of the screen. Inside the inspector, we have some controls for the start positions as well as the end positions. But like I mentioned, it also has some on-screen controls. So if we come and hit this button in the bottom left, we can switch this over to Fusion Overlay. You'll notice some points appear right away. If I drag these over, you can see this is going to change the start position, which is pretty much the perspective that the camera has relative to the screen. Then the X is going to be the start pivot, so this allows us to move back and forth. So if I put this closer to the subscribe button over here, I can come in the inspector and change the start distance, which just moves it closer or farther away from the screen. I also have the start focal length, so if I want to have a wide angle lens, I can drag this all the way out, or if I want to have a tighter lens, I can move this in. So I'm just going to set it to be something like that. I'm going to switch this over and move it so it's on the subscribe button. And once I have the first position set, I'm going to move to the end of the clip. Then I can grab the end pivot, move this over by the subscribe button again, grab this end position, drag it over so I get a different perspective, and back in the inspector I'm just going to match the start distance with the end distance, and same thing with the start focal length with the end focal length. So now what we have is the camera starting at the subscribe button, then rotating around just like it did before. By default there is some easing on it, so if you'd like you can come to the anim engine, come down and just switch this curve to be linear, and that way it's just going to move at the same rate of speed the entire time. Below those controls we have depth of field, so I can enable that with just one click. And now I can drag the start focus slider until the subscribe button comes in focus. There's two things you'll notice right away. One, it works really fast, and two, it's got a really nice uh, smooth blur across the entire image. And once I get it in focus, I can change stuff like the blur strength, I can also change the focus plane so that way it's got a really shallow depth of field, or really wide depth of field, and if needed you can also bring the blur quality up. Once you have those settings right, make sure to come to the end of the clip, and then bring this end focus down so that way that is in focus as well. And just like that we have a really nice 3D camera animation. Let's come to our project settings and switch this timeline to be 4K. Once that updates you can see all that pixelation has gone away, and real quick, I'm also just going to add in some chromatic aberration, come down to the scan lines, enable the scan lines as well, and now right click on the clip, do render in place, and then switch this to MP4. While that's rendering, Editor Collection is a pack of templates and presets for DaVinci Resolve that's designed to save you time. Just like this tool saves you a ton of time when creating 3D screens, there's other tools for just zooming in, animating objects, creating backgrounds, and everything in between. To learn more about that, visit the link down below. I really hope you guys learned something new creating this 3D screen effect, and if you have any questions, 
questions about it, please let me know. If you do this a lot, editor collection is definitely worth your money just for the amount of time this one tool is going to save you. But with all that being said, I'll see you guys next time for another video.